I just really was trying to emphasize is that you saw probably a lot of different apparatus and equipment come to you from, from different parts of the state. And that's really what our job is, is to help to bring those resources to those communities that are impacted and to work for those fire chiefs to supplement the resources that they have, really to take on that huge task that we've seen over the last couple of years. And then they're more than willing to do that. And what I call that is just neighbor helping neighbor. And so I know that Medford and Ashland and Grants Pass and a lot of your resources and the smaller departments from around this area have gone to other parts of the state to help out as well. So we'll continue to do that. But that's kind of our role as Plan C. So, uh, Dave Lawrence, let's see, this is working for me? Yeah. <laughs> Dave um, is a Senate Oregon Director for Oregon Department of Forestry. Uh, he's now in his 33rd year with the department. Uh, he graduated from Oregon State University and Linfield College and has worked in the agency's uh, private forests, state forest and protection divisions. Most of his field experience in Southern Oregon. Uh, before he went to ODF, the Oregon Department of Forestry, Dave worked for the Coos Forest Protective Association and the U.S. Forest Service in seasonal positions. Uh, this year will be his 39th fire season. Mm -hmm. <coughs> this one working? Yeah. All right. Uh, Jim didn't say it, but we actually started our careers together with CFPA, so he doesn't look like he is older than 39, but he is. Uh, so I also want to say thank you. Thank you to Representative Marsh for the opportunity to be here this evening, and thank you all for taking time out of your uh, busy schedules and evenings to be here. From my standpoint, this is about education. And it is through education, I think, that we all learn. We learn from you what's important to you, but, but hopefully you can learn something from us that will um, you know, help, help you all get through um, the fire season that are, that are definitely coming. Um, something that would be helpful for me is to maybe show a show of hands, who is from Jackson County? <coughs> all right. Who's from Josephine County? So a few. And who's not from either of those two counties? Okay. All right. That's helpful for me um, for me to know that. Um, so I do work with the Department of Forestry. We have three main field programs. We manage state forests, we manage private, or we help private landowners manage their land, and we have our fire protection program. Um, and um, sometimes we're, we're referred to as the largest fire department in the state of Oregon. We protect 60 million acres of forest land and grazing land across the state. And in Jackson and Josephine County, what that means is we're protecting basically all the forest land that is not um, owned and managed by the uh, U.S. Forest Service. So we're, we're protecting your lands if you've got forest land. Um, we do that through something that's referred to in statute as a complete and coordinated system. Um, and and that, has, that system has several prongs. And the first is prevention. And for us, the best fire is the fire that never starts. Uh, and we talk about prevention a lot, but that really is, is key to, to working towards the future and how we get through fire seasons is prevention. We've got a great uh, partner there with the Keep Oregon Green Association, if, you know, if you've heard them and know who they are. Uh, another prong of our fire suppression program, or our fire program, is pre-suppression. And there's a whole lot of pieces to that, but that is really um, about fuels reduction um, across the forest and about defensible space around homes. And, um, and there are uh, a couple handouts that I left out there on the table for you that talk about both of those prongs if, if you're interested in them. Please take down that there's more information available in those that you can refer to at a, at a future time. Also, early detection is really important to our uh, fire program. We've got a state-of-the-art um, smoke detection camera system. Most of that is centered in southern Oregon. Um, there are 14 of those cameras in Jackson and Josephine County. And they're, they've been proved to, uh, to be invaluable uh, for a lot of reasons uh, in, in the fire program. And then, of course, suppression. And um, Oregon statute defines any uncontrolled fire as a nuisance and directs us to put it out if it threatens lands that we're responsible to protect. And uh, we take that very seriously. Our number one priority is, uh, is life, and our second is the forest resource. Safety is a priority for us, for the public, and for our firefighters. Um, we strive to minimize firefighting costs and resource loss. 
There are times that, um, and, we, and we really strive to keep the fire small. Um, there are times that um, we just, the, the uh, situations out in the forest, uh, even with the weather, et cetera, makes it difficult to do that. Um, we have a target that we keep 98% of all of our fires at 10 acres or less. And in um, <coughs> the current year, including the 2018 fire season, we're likely not to hit that target. Uh, all of what we do, we don't, we don't do any of it alone. Jim referred to the partners that are scattered around, and we've got partners all around next to us. Our, our uh, rural fire districts are huge, landowners are huge, uh, but I, I could go on and on about partners, and I won't name them all because we don't have the time, but partnerships are huge in all we do. And quite honestly, uh, and I didn't say this earlier, but if you don't know it, you all are part of the complete coordinated wildfire system in Oregon. And, um, and I appreciate you know, what you do for that process as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Chris Chambers uh, with Ashland Fire and Rescue Forest Division Chief. Uh, Chris is an Ashland native, a graduate of OSU College of Forestry. Uh, he worked for the U.S. Forest Service and the BLM for five seasons before joining Ashland Fire and Rescue in 2002. He now serves as Forest Division Chief. Chris coordinated the National Fire Plan grants for six years with hundreds of private landowners, and he co-authored the 2004 Ashland Community Wildfire Protection Plan and the 2005 Jackson County Integrated Fire Plan. Chris serves on the International Association of Fire Chiefs Fire Department Exchange Program, helping to further wildfire safety programs in communities across the country and uh, responsible for a lot of the smoke you see coming up out of the National Watershed. <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah. Uh, good evening. It's really nice to see everybody here. And uh, thank you for spending your time with us this evening. I think it's uh, obviously a very important point in time for us as citizens of the Rogue Valley. And having grown up here, I have a pretty good feel for what that's like. And now raising my own family here, I definitely identify with the struggles that we're all experiencing in the Rogue Valley. Um, what I bring to the table for tonight is something maybe a little different than my colleagues here. And, uh, fire suppression and response isn't my primary job, though I do do that as well on the side when needed. But primarily, my job is uh, making things better before the fire starts, and to make their jobs most effective when they respond. And my colleagues at Ashton Fire and Rescue and all the partners in the Rogue Valley, when they come to help us, I want them to be safe and to be successful. And of course, we're serving the citizens of our town, and I think Ashland has a unique program and a unique experience to share in the Rogue Valley in that we have self-identified as being very prone to wildfire, and that's nothing new to anybody in the Rogue Valley, and, and it's not new to anybody in Ashland unless they just moved to town. But um, yeah, in recognizing that uh, since in the 80s, and we've been actively managing city forest lands for wildfire protection and for forest health since the mid-90s. And so we've accumulated a lot of experience on the wildland side as forest managers and ecosystem managers. Uh, and that's primarily my day-to-day -day job and representing the city and the National Forest Resiliency Project, which is a partnership with the Forest Service the Nature Conservancy and Lomakotsi Restoration Project, all of whom, except the Forest Service, of course, are, are here tonight also. Um, but uh, restoring the Ashland watershed and uh, reducing the fuels to protect the community when the wildfire comes. And then the other part of my job is also overseeing wildfire safety in the built part of Ashland. So what we call commonly the wildland urban interface, which basically encompasses all of Ashland. And um, that's no small job in and of itself, um, especially when we reflect on things like the campfire and what happened in Reading this summer and we start really scratching our heads and losing hair over how do we protect a community full of older homes made of wood surrounded by vegetation that is by and large pretty flammable. 
So um, what I hope to contribute is uh, that perspective of prevention and uh, how to make citizens and our community uh, safer before the fire visits us. And then, and then also what do we do when the fire happens and how do we respond appropriately and get people out of the way. Okay. I just uh, met uh, Jane Davis, the fire chief for Green Springs Rural Fire District uh, this summer when the uh, Climathon fire burned into Oregon and uh, provided a uh, pretty focused uh, threat to that community there and Jane was uh, up dealing with that. Uh, Co-founder of the Green Springs Rural Fire District and has served as the fire chief of the district for more than 15 years. This is an all-volunteer fire agency serving the Green Springs community. 20 miles southeast of Ashland. Uh, before that, uh, Jane worked in the Los Angeles Fire Department, <coughs> uh, which must have been an amazing thing, uh, in the Volunteer Auxiliary Communications Unit. And he also has worked for the Oregon State Fire Marshal as a communications unit leader with an all hazard incident management. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Don. I was a little surprised at being invited here from such a small district, uh, but uh, appreciate the opportunity nonetheless. And thank you everybody for showing up this evening. It, uh, it's a good sign to see so much interest in uh, preventing and helping to mitigate our uh, wildfire risk. I uh, run a very, very small fire district. Uh, we help protect about 250 square miles. Uh, with uh, very limited resources, limited financially, and also in terms of volunteer personnel who would be available. Uh, we're kind of in a unique position. We're isolated. So we're almost always first on scene to uh, a, you know, a given fire outbreak. So we do have some interesting perspectives that are generated from that factor. Uh, we're seeing more uh, fire starts every year and these fire starts are becoming much more intense than ever before. So there's a really huge concern on my part in trying to get my community prepared with fuel reduction or evacuation plans in the event that things go south. So uh, I really do welcome this collaborative effort. Uh, I am very concerned though that what we've been seeing in the last few years is not so much the new normal but perhaps just the beginning of a trend that is going to escalate a little bit every year. So what we do now in terms of working together, uh, fuel reduction, community awareness of wildfire danger, I think these things are going to become increasingly important in the years to come. Thank you. Um, I wonder if this little mic working here as well. <laughs> awesome. With that, Gene, I think I'm, I want to go back to Chris because uh, I was talking with Chris earlier and he had some points that he said he would either get to in his intro or by my invitation about uh, both speaking to the cohesive strategy and the need to all work together, all of these parts in motion at the same time, but a little bit about uh, how did we get to this place with uh, changes in uh, the forest fuels receptivity to fire the trend toward larger fires. Maybe some of the studies you've done specific to uh, local fuels. Well, I wish I could say I had done studies, but I'm just going to rely on my uh, very learned and excellent colleagues at the Nature Conservancy who are in the back there, specifically Dr. Carrie Mantlin, uh, who just uh, published a paper on this very topic. And uh, what it describes, and you know, obviously those of us who have been around, we don't remember it being this bad growing up here. And so things have definitely gotten worse. And there's a great uh, presentation. Has anybody been to the era of Magnifier presentation? It was actually in this room last year. A few hands went up and we hosted it a couple of times at Southern Oregon University uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, Dr. Paul Hesper does a really good job, one of the preeminent scientists in the field of fire and forest ecology, of describing how did we get to this point? Why all of a sudden do we have so much smoke in the air? And really, it's not all of a sudden. Uh, this has been a problem 
that has been uh, ripening for a long, long time, as far back as 160 years ago, when the role of the Native American tribes, the Shasta Tacoma tribes that inhabited this area, when the European settlers came and the tribes were extirpated from this area, they knew how to live with wildfire. And that's really what we're scratching our heads about right now, is how do we live with wildfire? Because it's <coughs> clearly an important piece of the ecology in our forests, but at the same time, it is an enormous problem. Um, before the settlement of the area, frequent fires, and this is what uh, Carrie's research addresses, is that fire was a frequent occurrence. Every eight to ten years on the drier forests of southern Oregon, there was a cleansing fire that came through. It burned out a lot of brush and a lot of seedlings. Trees averaged about 50 per acre, and typically big trees that could survive wildfires, but some small ones poking up and replacing the big ones. That went on for a long time. And essentially, when European settlers came, and then eventually we established a, a, a suppression policy that we were going to put all fires out by 10 a.m. the next day, that changed the character of our forests enormously. And we also started cutting down a lot of the big trees that were fire resistant. So there are forests out there now that have not seen their fire cycle, that eight-year cleansing fire. They haven't seen that since the mid-1800s. They've missed 20 fire cycles. And so we shouldn't be surprised now that there is a lot of fuel out in the forest. And it is fueling larger and larger fires, what Dr. Hesper calls the era of mega fires, the name of the presentation. And there's a TED Talk if you want to log on to Google and find that TED Talk. It's only 15 minutes, it's pretty quick, it's very informative. Um, but uh, another uh, colleague who's now retired described this situation as putting your finger over the garden hose. Fire was a steady trickle for a long time on our landscape. And then we just put our thumb over the hose. And now the pressure is building up and building up. And eventually, you just can't keep your thumb on the hose anymore, and it explodes. And that's what we're seeing currently, is fires exploding onto the landscape, quite literally, and causing a lot of changes to the forest, threatening communities, obviously causing a lot of smoke in the air, a lot of things that we didn't really intend we started putting out all those fires so long ago, but it is an unintended consequence of the suppression policy. So that's a little background and uh, just for a common frame of reference and, and how we got to where we are right now. Um, and there's a lot of uh, upshots from that and solutions and how do we get to a more sustainable place in the forest. Uh, thank you. And so that, that speaks to changes in the forest fuel <laughs> type. Have you, anybody care to comment on demographic changes, changes in settlement patterns, uh, development, because we, we also have the risk for within communities. Uh, I would invite any of you to. Yep. population and specifically the population growth in, in Washington, Oregon, and California, it really is out in that what we call the wildland urban interface. And so most folks are wanting to be, you know, close to the city limits but just outside of it. So you're starting to see a greater encroachment on those forested fuels that Chris was just talking about, the volatility of those. So what we're doing is we're just adding more fuel to the problem that we're currently seeing with the forest. And it's increasingly uh, growing at a fairly high rate, specifically here in Oregon. And, uh, complicated, I think, uh, fire suppression, but they generally acknowledge that there's a trend toward that. Uh, fire season is 60, 80 days longer than it was 20, 20 years ago. Roughly. Is that the main the ballpark there? So I know there's a lot of folks in the room here uh, critically concerned with climate change. How has that affected your uh, preparedness plan. Dave, <clears throat> yeah, speak to that. 
So in terms of, you know, in terms of preparedness, I mean, we, I think we go through a similar process as we have done, you know, for a long time. But um, we do take a look and um, we have tried to uh, expand and increase our resources to respond to the wildfires that, we, that we're having. Um, one of the things that's been really beneficial, you know, five last six fire seasons have been worse than average. We budget locally for an average worst fire season, and five out of the last six have been worse, way worse than average. And so one of the things that's been really beneficial is um, some additional severity funding that we started getting a few years back. That's funded um, by uh, landowner assessments that you all pay. It's also funded by some general fund, and thank you to the legislature and the legislators that are here um, that provide that funding. But um, having those additional severity resources, when I'm talking about there, there's a whole lot of aviation resources. Type 2 helicopters, our Type 1, um, or I'm sorry, our large air tanker that's stationed here, as well as uh, a crew, some detection aircraft, and some other things. But those are those have been really key, and we have, uh, you know, in the in the last you know few years, been able to increase increase those severity resources. Yeah, we started looking at things a lot earlier as well because things are starting earlier. We used to look on average about July 23rd was the first conflagration or the state mobilization of resources to an incident somewhere in the state of Oregon. And over the last couple summers, we've seen that in the early part of June. So knowing that, uh, we know that we're just one part of this complete and coordinated system. So we're that structural piece. And so we started here a number of years ago training with the Oregon Department of Forestry and others. So we actually have incident management team training together. And we try to meet early March, early April, uh, because we know that by having that collaboration and that partnership, when we get into a chaotic situation, we all know what our responsibilities are and we can be more cohesive than if not. We've also started working with a lot of the, the smaller partner departments around the state to help to support them to come up with plans and put plans in place for what types of resources we might need in those given areas and what types of resources that we can send. So we know very early on in the summer now what we do have available uh, for task forces. And when I say task forces, that's a, a, a complement of five uh, engines. The state of Oregon, um, it would really have a lot of incidents occurring at the same time. We put together about 22 strike teams or 22 task forces. That means those resources are available to come from, again, some other part of the state to help another part of the state. There's 318 fire departments in the state of Oregon. Not all of them can obviously participate because some of them are solely volunteer and some of them may only have one apparatus and they need to leave that within their communities. But we can muster about 22, and so we do task force leader training early on, fire team training early on, and we see it earlier and earlier all the time because, like you say, it's no longer a July, August, September issue. It's an issue that's starting a lot earlier and ending a lot later. Thank you. So I was talking with Gene uh, earlier. You've been up at the Green Springs 15 years now, long enough probably to see some changes, some trends, and uh, just when you thought maybe fire season was over for us locally, uh, Final Falls had a fire. Tell us about that. Oh, okay. Yeah, there was a, a very recent fire uh, in Klamath Falls uh, on Schuylkill Mountain. I believe it went uh, somewhere around 10 acres. And looking at uh, some of the photographs from this fire, it was really shocking. Uh, here we are in January, and I'm looking at uh, a photograph of a hillside that's on fire with uh, 15, 20 foot flame lengths in some areas. So this uh, this is really highly unusual, and uh, to me just is another indication of the trend that we're seeing uh, over the last several years. How does that influence your planning for protection for your community? Well, it, uh, it certainly does lend a huge sense of urgency to pre-planning, but um, you know, it's, uh, with the limited resources that we have, it's very, very, it's a difficult proposition to uh, to really be able to say that, yeah, we've planned for every contingency up here. Um, and we're always very thankful for the resources that are available 
locally with our Rogue Valley strike teams and task forces, and also the resources that the state fire marshal can bring to bear when we have a really big fire. Yes. From the prevention perspective, it also the clim climate change also causes some issues for us, and one of our big tools box is using fire proactively, control burning or prescribed burning. And when we go through winter time, you know, we spend a lot of time cutting brush and small trees and putting it into neat little burn piles. And then we expect it's going to rain and the ground's going to get wet and the logs and all that stuff around are going to get wet and we're going to burn those burn piles. And with climate change and drier and drier winters happening, we lose those opportunities to go out there and do the kind of burning that we need to do to get ahead of the issue. I mentioned 50 trees per acre was the historic condition. We're at a, over 175 trees per acre now in the Ashland area. Uh, so we have a lot of fuel to deal with, and when we don't get the conditions to deal with that fuel, when it's wet and cold, then it just sits there and we uh, keep it during fire season when we definitely don't want that fuel sitting out there in the forest. Um, just anecdotally, we've had fire uh, control burns that we've done burning those piles, and we had uh, fire creep down into stumps that used to get wet when it rained, and rained a lot, but that doesn't really happen so much anymore, or big logs, and fire will just hang out there. We had fire hanging out there for seven weeks in a stump or a log, I can't remember which. And then it got windy and dry in the middle of, I think it was February, and that fire popped up and it went off. And it didn't do anything bad, but uh, it makes it really difficult to do the work that we need to do to get ahead of the problem uh, under climate change. So what we've just talked about, and as grim as it seems, is a increasingly difficult uh, and complex fire suppression picture, fire <coughs> protection. Uh, and so when we talk about fire in terms of risk management, both risk to communities and risk to partners. And you're always balancing those. So you're willing to invest the uh, risk to your firefighters to protect values and risk in the communities. Can any of you say anything about risk assessment? How you decide what you're going to, where you're going to accept risk for your firefighters and for your organization? I hope that's not a big surprise to you. So that's that's a tough question. Um, and um, we train all of our firefighters um, to be their own safety officer. We ask our firefighters to be their own safety officer. We do that through a lot of um, training, education, a lot of on-the-job training. And we ask them to look um, you know, assess the situation when they get out to a fire, and we ask them to, if, if they feel it's unsafe, we ask them to say something. We want to know if they think it's unsafe. We also want to know what the hazard is and how, are there ways to mitigate that hazard? For example, if there's a critical piece of fire line that needs to go in and there is a snag overhanging it and it's just not safe, you know, can we fall the snag? Can we go around it? You know, there's some other things we can do. And so we ask our firefighters to pay attention because, um, again, as I said earlier, safety is number one for us. Safety for our fire, fires and safety for the public. And so, um, you know, when, when we can't make something safe, you know, we, we will have to do some, take some different strategy or tactic. Um, but that is, I mean, that is how we go about assessing. Um, and we ask our firefighters to do that uh, on their own. And, um, and, you know, when we have the management teams out, we've got safety officers that are helping with, with all of that sort of thing. And um, so I, I don't know if that helps Don. But. It, it does. Jim, could you have something to say? Yeah, this is a good opportunity to kind of build on what Dave's talking about. You know, one of the things that we had to do in State Fire Marshal's office's teams is we added additional line safety support. And as you know, emergency responders want to do everything they possibly can to, to mitigate loss of life or property. And so this is kind of my plug to you folks, is help us to be able to help you. Because when those resources, they, when they get there, especially those ones, those state resources, they're arriving usually after working all day, 
They're arriving at nighttime. They're arriving early in the morning. They haven't had an opportunity to really get a good visual look at where they're working. And so we rely on those folks an awful lot to make really smart decisions. But when they get in there, the first thing, like I say, they want to do is they wanted to get in there and protect your home. So when they start talking about defensible space and we start talking about the things that you could do within your community, don't just think of, well, this is one more thing that I have to do. Think of it as if somebody that you knew was responding to your home to help to save it, are you giving them the ability to do that? And so that's my big plea to you folks is help us to be able to help you. And that's that piece of giving us that true defensible space to get those folks in there because we need to take safety seriously. Chris, how are we doing in the city of Ashton for assessing uh, risk and, and mitigating risk to the structures? It's a complicated picture. Um, we Risk assessments are a tool that's used in our industry continually. Risk assessments can look at really big areas. There's a risk assessment that covers the entire western United States. There's a risk assessment for the state of Oregon that looks at where are our vulnerable areas. There's a risk assessment for the Rogue River Basin that prioritizes areas for wildfire fuels reduction. And there's a risk assessment uh, that just came out of the Pacific Northwest that talks about communities at risk. And I can guarantee that of the top 20 communities in Washington and Oregon that we live, you and I live in most of those places on the list there that are the most, some of the most dangerous places on their list. Um, Bedford actually was uh, pretty high on the list. I was so surprised. Uh, higher than Ashland. Um, so it's this, uh, an issue of scale. And how do you look at what the risk is? Well, you, know, you look at the state of Oregon, and the risk to a certain place might not be that bad. But if you look at just one community, and within that community, you need to consider where you live in relation to wildland areas. Um, what's the propensity for fire to throw embers that might land on your roof and in your gutter and next to your house? And so that's what we're trying to wrestle with right now in the city of Ashland. And I don't know of many places that are, are doing it uh, the way that we're trying to do it. But um, we're trying to map that risk out to a very, very fine scale. And the problem with some of the products out there, there's even one called Oregon Wildfire Risk Explorer, that have played around with at the state level, but when you try to look at your house, it doesn't translate because there's a scale issue with how they look at wildfire risk from the state of Oregon down to your single house. And I want to change that so that people can feel like they can interact with all this great technology that's out there. You can go online and find your house and find out something meaningful. And so what we're working on right now, and a lot of communities are doing something similar I know it's happening in Medford and on Fire District 3, some in Fire District 5 around the valley and other places where they're actually, we do have a common mapping program amongst all of us um, that we can use and you can actually assess that risk down at the scale of one house. And that can be very interesting information for you to have if it's your house, right? Well, how did the fire department think about my house and what could I do to make it better? Uh, and that's something that we're working on also is a, a portal to that information so it's easy to understand what you can do to reduce your risk and to make our efforts a lot more successful when fire does happen. And I, I would invite you to comment that I saw on your Facebook page uh, a month or so ago that uh, the home burned uh, in your district that you couldn't get to, you couldn't get up the driveway and uh, it must have been pretty hard for Oh, certainly, and, and that is a big challenge that we face in our uh, in our location, which is basically isolated and heavily forested. It can't really even be uh, classified as an urban interface or a wildland interface. Uh, we're basically a heavily forested wildland area with homes uh, located all over the 250 square miles that we serve. So it's a very difficult proposition. And uh, Don mentioned a home that we lost recently due to fire. Uh, this was a flu fire. And unfortunately, our ability to act on this fire was extremely limited by very poor, almost non-existent access to the structure. 
so we couldn't safely bring any of our equipment uh, uh, within reach, and we just had very limited resources. We could only flow uh, very small amounts of water on this fire. So this is something that we uh, depend on our residents uh, to help us with, and that is maintaining good access for emergency equipment uh, to your home or business, and then taking care to reduce the fuel load around your structure, uh, keeping your fire brakes uh, clean, and uh, make our job at least possible. Uh, in the case of this structure fire, it, it was an impossible situation for us from the beginning because we couldn't even get up, uh, couldn't get any of our equipment up to this place. So that, uh, that's a very, very important point that uh, fire prevention and mitigation really starts with each individual on their property, how they, how they treat it, and how well prepared they are. Thank you all. Anything else on that? Uh, so another risk to, uh, you know, no matter how well you do, let's say you live in a green belt in town and there's nothing burning on your property, another big risk to all of you is smoke. And it can come from something so far away that you've, you've never even been there. And uh, uh, as you know, we have regional air quality impairment the last couple of years of significant. Uh, in terms of community protection, that's one of the things that all these folks are trying to protect you from. The economic losses and the health uh, impacts of smoke. Can any of you tell me that we can do, are there any particular strategies available to us that, can help us minimize smoke impacts from wildfire. Okay. Well, that, that is the big question, of course. Uh, what can we do about the smoke? And um, I, I want to read a quick quote from, again, from Paul Hesburgh in the Arab Megafire presentation. And uh, after all of Dr. Hesburgh's studies and hundreds of research publications, he says, there is no future without fire and smoke. That option is actually not on the table. So the only choice is, how do we let that smoke happen in a way that does not have the impacts to our economy, to our health? And that's a tricky proposition. And, and that's what we're wrestling with in Ashland and our uh, forest projects, and how do we get that burning done? How do we let the smoke go away from town, away from the valley? It's not always going to be perfect. We are going to have some smoke, but a little bit of smoke in the spring or the fall is a lot better than that heavy wildfire smoke that we experience during the summer. And it's not a one-to-one -one trade off. Yeah, we're still going to have wildfires. We're not going to get rid of wildfires altogether. That's just not possible. But we can definitely minimize the impact. Uh, is one of the pieces of the cohesive strategy for a restoration in the road basin. A, uh, a handout that is actually out there, so you can pick it up later if you didn't get one on your way in. Um, this is something that's being pushed by the Southern Oregon Forest Restoration Collaborative. To join the board of that organization, but there are other board members in the audience out here uh, working on something called the Rogue Basin Strategy. It's a 20 to 30 year proposition, and considering it took us well over 100 years to get into this mess, 20 or 30 years isn't bad, but I know that's also not great news when we're having smoke every summer. But if we tackle this uh, with an aggressive uh, pursuit of it, uh, we can reduce wildfire risk by up to 70% across the Rogue Basin. We can reduce wildfire risk to homes by up to 50%. And when we do that, we can reduce some of the smoke exposure uh, to our communities, to our health, and to our economy. And you know, long term, uh, we have to really engage with that. We have to interact with our politicians and demand that those kinds of initiatives get funded. It's an expensive thing to go out there and do all this work, but it also puts people to work. We're talking about 1,700 jobs over 20 years. I mean, that's a lot more than all the people in here many times over. 
Um, so we're also talking about a new economy for the Rogue Valley, a green economy, a lot of forestry jobs, and we send a lot of logs to local mills when we do that work. Ashland, which you know, 10 or 20 years ago, who would have thought of Ashland as a place that's going to send a lot of logs to the mill? Oh, we sent 15 million board feet of logs to local mills from Roseburg to Wairika over the past eight or nine years, and that's jobs uh, in all of those places, uh, not to mention all of the forest workers who are directly making a living on the ground who live in our communities. And so there's an upside to all this. Um, I wish I could say that there's a way to make the smoke go away <clears throat> tomorrow, um, but unfortunately, um, from where I sit, that's not going to happen. But what we can do is aggressively pursue all avenues, and, and that's one of them, and a very hopeful one. Uh, but there are others, and we have to have all of our tools in the toolbox. So just building on what Chris said about uh, prescribed fire, I really do agree with uh, what you say there. Um, and there are some new proposed smoke management rules that are out there, and they've actually been um, approved by the Board of Forestry. Uh, I think it was last week. They're moving through the system. The EQC, Environmental Quality Commission, is kind of next up. And, and those rules, if approved um, and, and they become uh, effective, should create some additional opportunities for uh, prescribed fire at the right time, at the right place, to try to minimize smoke in communities while still creating opportunities, to, more opportunities to minimize that fuel loading out there. And, and those rules do give local communities a, a, a bit uh, more uh, voice in terms of how much smoke they may, they may want to uh, endure as well. So there, those are out there, just know that, that so that um, is something to know. The other thing I would just say too, in terms of reducing smoke during fire season, 70% of our fires that occur on our protection are human caused. And lightning storms that come through are our biggest problem because we get a whole bunch of starts all at once and it can overwhelm our system. But throw on top of that a handful of human-caused fires, and it's not anything that we need as, uh, as firefighters, and it's nothing that you need as citizens as well. So prevention, again, I mentioned that earlier, but that is that is really key, I think, in terms of even something like reducing the amount of smoke. And you all can um, help us with that as well. Let's just let's just keep talking about prevention here a little bit. We'll move away from smoke. We'll talk about intercepting these emissions. Um, we're not doing real well with preventing lightning. Um, there is something as a folklore. Uh, I was exposed to the ideas uh, this summer. Some folks suggested that we put uh, lightning rods on every mountain and uh, somehow protect ourselves from natural fire in a fire dependent ecosystem. I don't think we're going to do very much with uh, intercepting lightning. Human caused fires, it seems like we're doing better all the time. What else can you say? What, what, give me a couple of strategies we could do to improve prevention of human caused fires. And if you, if you can't come up with something, I'm going to ask you something tough, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Dave's getting ready to talk, so I figure if I just put a little bit out there, then he'll you know, put a bow around it and get you to where you really want to go. But. I think because as we started seeing mega fires over the last uh, number of years, our focus, at least from the state agency, has been really towards suppression and asking that question, what do we need as far as resources to protect life and property? And I don't think we've necessarily done a real good job about asking for those prevention tools. And so that's one of the things, and I'm glad there's a lot of legislative folks in here because I spent the last probably six months going in front of the e-board asking for funding to fund all of those firefighters that responded from around the state on the suppression. I have not gone in front of any of the legislative folks and asked for prevention. And that's really where I think we need to start focusing is on that prevention piece. Because if we can just invest more in prevention and stop these fires, as many as we possibly can, that are caused by human humans, we're going to be in a lot better spot as far as the state goes, and obviously the state funding as, as well. Because um, we've invested in data, we've started really trying to look and collect as much data as we possibly can to find out what are those things that are starting fires, and then what are those things that we could then maybe prevent. 
is as you know, some of these things, when we talk about human caused fires, uh, one of the big challenges that California is seeing is, is down power lines or exploding transformers. Okay? That's considered to be a human caused fire. What can we really do you know, to mitigate those types of things? We've looked at things that we can do for dragging chains down the roads. Has anybody seen the little things you can put over your chains now You know, to keep that from occurring? Uh, believe it or not, if you look at going down I-5, we've had a number of fire starts this year. Those are the types of things that we're looking at. Can we, can we come up with something that might be able to help to prevent those things? So what I'm really asking is if you have some really great ideas that you can think of that we might be able to look at, and if we can get some support, and we can get some funding, and we can get some investment in, in folks to really start putting that emphasis on prevention as opposed to suppression, I think we'll give a little So, tying a bow around that. Um, so, one, you know, to build on what Jim said there, um, to 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 really know, um, you know, what's causing the fires, what the, you know, what are the real issues, requires fire investigation. We investigate every fire that we have, um, but I've wondered whether. You know, some additional investment there, something more robust to really get down to the, the nut about what is what is causing, uh, you know, a given fire. Yeah, it's a chainsaw, but what about that chainsaw, for example? Um, and so, I think we do a really good job, um, but I want, I wondered whether that's a place we could invest some more. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to, to raise your hand again if you if you if you so choose, but. How many of, and so so changing away from um, kind of in fire investigation, how many of you have kind of looked at our fire regulations, so Oregon Department of Forestry's fire regulations and not really known exactly what you could do or not do on a given day? I mean, are they completely clear all the time? No. You can't raise your hand. No. Um, so we recognized that a couple of years ago and that there was inconsistencies between our districts Across Southern Oregon, and so a land, you know, a, a, someone from the public driving, you know, across the landscape, they don't know when they cross one line of a district to another, and so we've tried to create some uniformity um, that will allow people to, you know, have better understanding to know what they can do and when they can do it, and um, so that really is all, all about fire prevention, and we, um, you know, and, and it's going to vary. You know, clearly, fire danger is a lot more severe down here for more days than it is up around Eugene. But there is more uniformity now, and hopefully, it's clear to understand. And we've created messaging that will that will hopefully help with that. So, if you, can, you know, those of you that raised your hand, if if this summer, if you um, still, if it still is confusing, we want to fix that because we we want. We know the vast majority of people are trying to do the right thing all the time, and we want to help do that. And the last thing we want to do is, is have someone have a fire because there was a misunderstanding about what was something, what was allowed and not allowed. Um, so, thank you, Jim. Yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, applaud Dave and ODF. Uh, I have certainly noticed a really large improvement over the last several years in terms of the availability of that kind of information, and uh, especially on the ODF website and the website blog. And it's readily available, easy to share, and uh, I just want to add, in terms of prevention, I think public education is really a huge, uh, a huge asset, uh, as, as well as common sense, and that's a really important thing especially in my district, uh, you know, every single year before the start of fire season, we have one, two, three, or more fires, human cause, that are a result from uh, usually open burning or debris burning. Uh, it's, it's still, it's not fire season, so it's still legal to burn, but, uh, you know, a little bit of common sense would probably dictate this is not a good time to burn anymore. So we need to add to add that asset to our toolbox as well as all the regulations that are in place. It seems like we uh, 
We talked about uh, risk assessment, a little bit about mitigation, about changing the fuels so that when we do get a fire, it's a different kind of a fire. Uh, we made some, uh, some recommendations about prevention. What else can we tell this audience about how they can avoid transfer to risk? I mean, own, own the risk. Uh, I think there's plenty of resources for folks to know how to make your, your uh, property a little less likely to burn. And uh, what do you do uh, when fire impinges on you or if you're affected by smoke? Is there anything else that we could offer them? Anything shiny and new that we need to tie people into? <coughs> If it comes up for you, we'll, we'll return to it. I'd like to, I'd like to talk about, we're about halfway through our time. Let's see. You bet. Well, as we saw in the campfire, one of the big things that was the fire that, yeah, in paradise, um, not a campfire, but the campfire, uh, is the need to get people evacuated early when a fire starts. And so being informed about what the evacuation levels are, what they mean, and making sure you are signed up for the Jackson and Josephine County alert system, which is called Everbridge or Citizen Alert. How many people are signed up in Citizen Alert? That's pretty good, maybe half, but there's probably half of you who aren't gonna get the evacuation notification when it goes out. Um, there are different ways that happens. Uh, Ashland actually has a little different system. It's still kind of part of that system, but it's called Nixel, and we put out lots of information about how to sign up for Nixel. Um, but if you have a landline, which a lot of people don't have landlines these days, um, landlines are entered into those alert systems, commonly referred to as reverse 911 systems also. Um, landlines are captured. So if you have a landline, that data gets captured by the agencies that run that program and you're in there. But if you aren't home and you want to find out about an evacuation that might be happening at your house, or you could even register another location like a school or an elderly parent's house, um, you can put those locations into the system too when you register. Um, but if you don't have a landline and you just have a cell phone, those cell phone numbers cannot be captured in those systems. You have to put your number voluntarily into the system. And so that relies on you actually doing something, going to a computer, registering via the county website. Jackson or Josephine County have the information on their websites about how to register. Ashland does as well. Um, it can be a pretty simple process but uh, we've seen the difficulties in other communities with getting those notifications out and getting them out early. And I, mean, that, I think that's one of our pledges to you is we need to get that message out as fast as we possibly can when structures are threatened so that you have the most time to get out of there safely. And you know, it's not always an easy thing when crews are first showing up on scene, they wanna try to get a hold of the fire but um, something that we're gonna start training harder on these days is um, if it's obvious that homes are gonna be impacted, we need to go into that rescue mode right away. And that includes sending out those alerts as fast as we can possibly do it. They all work by cell phones on our end, so I can launch an alert out in the middle of the woods um, as long as I've got cell phone reception. And, um, and it will go to as many people as I want it to go to. So, um, do go home and figure that out and be part of that system. Uh, it's really important for your safety. Yeah, and I just want to take the opportunity too to, to kind of expound on that a little bit because if you take a look at a lot of those large devastating fires, uh, when the responders are getting there, what's the first thing that they're actually doing? Is they're trying to evacuate people on out of there. They're not able to take any type of suppressive action whatsoever because their number one priority again is life and trying to get that life on out of there. And so how many people have heard of the three different levels, level one, two, and three, or ready, set, go, right? I hate to say it, but in Southern Oregon, you know, with the exception of just a couple of months, you might as well consider yourself being a level one. So we should just start there, you know. It's kind of putting a plan in place that says if something bad does occur, how am I going to get out of here? Where am I going to go? 
The next one is level two, and to be honest with you, you start getting into the, to the month of June, okay, you should be thinking level two. You should be thinking about those things that you've got packed, all those really important <coughs> documents or keepsakes or whatever it is that you think that you really want to save. You better be thinking about it then, before the incident occurs. Uh, like Dave was mentioning, this will be my 39th year, and I've been involved in a lot of evacuations, and it's amazing what people will try to save, or it's amazing what people go back in to save because they're in panic mode, and they'll save the darndest things. So what I'm saying is, is early in the month of June for this area, start thinking about that level two, and all of those things that you really want to have in that bag ready to go when you get out the door. And then when you do your level three, we take it very serious. The sheriff is the one that actually uh, comes up with those levels. They're the ones that are actually responsible for getting people out. But we get a large group of folks together, some really smart people get together to make those decisions on level one, two, or three. And we take it very serious when we say level three. So a group of people say level three, that really does mean go. And so you need to get out there as quick as you possibly can. So again, Southern Oregon, I'd probably say sometime right about March, you're at level one. Okay. I'm not the sheriff, but I'm just going to throw that one out at you. And probably sometime around June or so, you're in a level two, so think about those things that you want to take with you, because that really is <coughs> important. Because if you take a look at those large devastating incidences, that's where a lot of those fatalities occur in the evacuation process. Chris, what about anyone? What about evacuation around planning? Is that, are we where we need to be? Do people know how to get out of their communities and where they're going to go? That one's a little controversial. Ashland went down the path years ago of dedicating wildfire evacuation routes. We put up pretty little signs that say wildfire evacuation route in hopes that we could direct people to the quickest way down off the hill and down onto the main arterial streets in town. Um, but you could also argue we shouldn't dedicate those areas because we don't know where the fire is going to start. We don't know where it's going to come from. It might come from over the hill, but it might come from within the community and be burning up the hill towards the forest. So um, you, you can make a case either way on evacuation routes. Um, maybe we should dedicate them. Maybe we shouldn't. Um, one of the issues is coming in to a community for the mutual aid so when the state fire marshal sends those strike teams and task forces down, they got to be able to get into the area, and that's something that's a problem in all the mass evacuation type fires, is how do we get the additional resources for putting the fire out into the community while everybody is trying to get out of the community. And so uh, we're going to engage in traffic studies and looking at how we need to manage traffic to get in and out of town in those kinds of scenarios, I think we're better off than what happened in Paradise because we have more exit points that aren't going to be, we hope, aren't going to be on fire as people are trying to use them. But there are plenty of communities across Jackson and Josephine County that have really challenging exit strategies. And um, it's worth uh, talking to your local officials, uh, the fire chief, city council, whoever you can get a hold of to talk about how do we get out of here when things get really bad. And there's no easy answer, and there may not be a right answer because it depends on what the fire is doing at the time. And that's another reason to be uh, registered into those alert systems is because you can get mobile alerts via texts, emails, phone calls, whatever you want. And if you're not at home and you're trying to evacuate, you're going one way, and then all of a sudden you get a message that says, oh, I better go the other way, then well, you better listen to that message and go where the incident command folks are telling you to evacuate. Yes, Gene, I can see you're reflecting on your recent uh, experience there. Well, I was just thinking, in, in our case, in our little mountain district, it's, it's a pretty simple formula. There are only three ways in or out. So we don't have to do a lot of planning. Just uh, find out where the fire is and go the other way. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, uh, I, I want to reiterate and uh, emphasize the importance of having uh, data, having intelligence on what's going on. And the best way to do that as a resident or a citizen is to sign up for the citizen's alert 
and, and get that information in a very timely manner. Uh, and it, it, could save your, it could save your life. So it's very, very important. And it's something that I emphasize every chance I get uh, in my district. So I'd, I'd like to hear about uh, infrastructure, your firefighting infrastructure. Uh, that's facilities and equipment uh, that maximize your tactical options. And what do you see coming? What, what are advances? In, are we getting any better at fighting fire? Is there anything we need to do? I mean, you know, we uh, keep building bigger airplanes, but there, there's a limit to that. I think we're obviously looking at you know what could technology do for us. The, the equipment that we're sending to the incidences is obviously uh, better than the equipment that uh, Dave and I originally started out with again 39 years ago. Um, so we do have better equipment. We have, do have better personal protective equipment. Uh, we've got uh, better training uh, for the resources, uh, both in safety and in tactics. Um, but I think we're just on the kind of on the spear, on the tip of the spear, when we're really looking at what kind of data is out there that can use that we can use to be more successful. Um, there's a couple different programs that we're looking at right now. Uh, one of them, MODIS, which is really kind of a neat thing, is we get a satellite image of the fire itself, and so we can actually look at where is the heat of the fire at, what direction is it going, is it going. Um, those uh, areas that have actually gone out and plotted all of their, their homes and those things, we can actually see those as well. So we know if it's threatening a community, not threatening a community, where we need to send the most resources. So if we look, you know, instead of before, we'd have to get a number of folks out on the ground and they'd have to triage it, assess it. Now we have the ability, because of satellites, uh, imaging to say this is really collectively where we need to send that first set of uh, apparatus on in. The other thing that we've just started losing, using the last couple uh, years are drones. And where the drones really help us is they can get underneath the smoke. So we always hear, you know, everybody's got a lot of really great, there's probably a number of you in the room that got really great suggestions on aviation resources and the types of resources that we should use. And I always say we got these really smart aviation folks on these incident management teams, and they'll use any tool that they can possibly use. Their biggest frustration over the last probably three or four years is the fact that we can't fly it, and we can't fly it because of the smoke. So what we found is there's a number of these drones that you can actually get that can go underneath the smoke, and they can actually give us an assessment on where is the fire at, where is it going. Um, if anybody here remembers the Eagle Creek fire, which was a couple years ago that was over in the gorge, we were actually able to use one of those drones and we were able to transmit it to the folks on the ground. So now you can take, you know, the little smartphone and you can get some of that imaging. And so I'm out there on the incident at nighttime. And as we know at nighttime, it's really difficult to see exactly where is the fire at and where it's going. And it's fairly dangerous to be doing that. But we believe we can do really good work at night. So now we're able to, they can go on their phones and all of a sudden they go, well, there's the fire. It's still on the other side of the ridge or it's coming over the ridge. So there's some tools out there that I think that we are in the process of assessing and, and seeing how it can not only help us tactically, but how it can help us with safety um, as well. So Jim talked about drones getting under the smoke, and, and we've seen some great use of drones as well um, over the last couple of years. Um, but there's another aircraft called a multi-mission aircraft, and we've utilized one of those from Colorado. Um, over the last three years. I don't think we're able to get it this last uh, in 2018. But that actually flies, I don't know that it's above the smoke, it's in the smoke, but it's really high. But it flies fast, it's got incredibly uh, sensitive infrared, I don't even know the technology. I'll say it's infrared because I don't know what it's called. Um, but it's able to detect fires, at, you know, like a campfire from a long ways away, very high, and when, you know, when you all are suffering from smoke in your valley, the state-of-the-art smoke detection system that we have is basically obsolete. It can't look through the smoke. So one of these, one of these aircraft, and we've been able to borrow one, um, and I hope we can again, but it's been able to pick up some fires for us that we didn't know were there. Um, and that's been really huge. Last summer, um, in Eastern Oregon, we were short, we, couldn't, we 
couldn't get that aircraft, we couldn't get infrared imagery uh, from any other sort of uh, process. So we used some technology from the military, and they were able to fly, which was a huge benefit, because they picked up a couple of fires, and I think one of them was 100 acres in size that we didn't even know about, because it was, it was too much smoke. And so, um, so that sort of thing could be really beneficial to us as well. Um, despite the fact that the smoke detection cameras do get smoked out and can have periods of time in the summer that they're not useful, expanding that would be really huge as well. Because they're not only useful for the detection, but our fire managers, can, just like Jim can pick up you know, lots of things on his phone, our fire managers can have their phone look and I mean, I could right now pick up our smoke detection camera if it were not dark outside and show you, you know, what, what a particular fire was doing. If you're a fire manager and you can look at that and you can make an instantaneous decision whether you need to send more of any sort of resource to that fire because it's doing something that you weren't expecting. So that's really huge as well. So expanding that would be great. And not so much, and so one other thing to answer your question, sorry if I'm taking too much time here. We've got time. It's not really a technology thing as such, but it is something that's out there that we're dabbling in a bit um, in, in Western Oregon now, <coughs> on, on, in Eastern Oregon, but that's, that's the Good Neighbor Authority. And, and the purpose of the Good Neighbor Authority is to help um, advance the pace and scale of restoration on, on federal lands. And so that, you know, through the Good Neighbor Authority, there's lots of things that we can do, and we're, we've got a lot of work that's going on. We're pretty sensitive about the Good Neighbor Authority because you know there's different work there. There's some funding that the Forest Service and the BLM has that we can use um, in, in help some restoration projects on those lands. But then there's another whole element of the Good Neighbor Authority that involves timber sales. And, the, and so we're really sensitive about Good Neighbor Authority because any Good Neighbor Authority project that involves a timber sale the bulk of those revenues come to the Department of Forestry for us to use on future restoration projects. Those are funds that the county wouldn't get. And so we're sensitive to that. We have a lot, we're having lots of conversations with the counties about that. Um, and we're really careful that the work that we're doing, particularly in relation to timber sales, is additive. It's above and beyond what um, the normal work is that the counties, uh, or that the uh, uh, the forest or the BLM would be doing so that it's not um, taking revenues from the immediate revenues from the county. So, so that that's another item that is out there that will help hopefully in the long term reduce some fuels across the landscape in strategic ways that um, will help us control fire. Thank you. Uh, that's it, Jim. Uh, as far as uh, technological improvements, I think the uh, uh, we're going to get the the most bang for our buck in uh, improving detection technology. And uh, just a really, a really brief story. Uh, last fire season, we had a 10-acre uh, fire burning right adjacent to Highway 66. There was lots of traffic going by both ways for hours while this fire was burning. Nobody reported it because nobody could see it through all the smoke from all the other fires. So it, it was a, a big, serious fire right by the highway, and it was undetectable until we got lucky, and uh, Klamath Falls, I believe, uh, who at the time had access to MODIS or to satellite imagery, was able to pick up this hotspot on a, on a satellite infrared image, and they transmitted that information to our Jackson County ODF, and uh, we were notified of this fire, of this fire in, that, in that way. So, yeah, uh, anything we can do to improve detection, uh, technologically speaking, is going to pay uh, huge dividends. And I had a question, Dave. Do we have that available to us in Jackson County? Yeah. Uh, MODIS? Yeah. We do, okay. Uh, at the time of this fire, I, I was under the impression that it was not. No, I'm, I was down here a lot this summer, and I was using notice. So, I, you know, maybe there was a maybe there was a day. Sometimes with any technology, there's anomalies on a given day. Maybe it wasn't up that day, but um, yeah, I'm certainly I can check though. Yeah, because that was a huge asset. Otherwise, if, if we had.
had not caught that fire with that satellite imaging, <coughs> it easily would have gone to 1,500 acres, and then from that point could have been uh, could have turned into a, a catastrophic fire. Where um, where are your most vulnerable resource shortages? What do you really, really need to have more of? Uh, you, get, you see, in a, in a typical fire season, when it gets gnarly, for the end people start uh, mm -hmm. saying, we have critical shortages of, for instance, Type 1 crews, Type 1 aircraft. What, what are the things that you worry about that you really need to add to your toolkit? We'll start with you, Jim. Yeah, I want to make a plug. You know, as we've been talking about these mega fires, these epic fires, we've been talking about detection is we have a number of departments that are here. We have a number of departments that uh, that, that didn't really want to be noted or not. But we, that's really where it starts, is, is we really need to take a look at our local initial attack resources. Uh, because as you know, these fires are getting up and they're going so fast. So by the time we arrive, or by the time the state gets there, uh, these things are already, you know, 1,000 acres, 2,000, 3,000 acres. So I just want to make a plug is, is really what can you do locally is one, if you, if you see it, don't assume somebody else has seen it, call it in, that's okay. And the other piece is to support your local responders because I think that's what we need to do is make sure that we're equipped better at that initial attack mode to hit it hard and hit it fast. Thank you. Any other comments on that? Um, so five or six years ago, we asked ourselves that question in Southern Oregon. And what came back from our district foresters was, aircraft and crews. And we've made some improvements in those uh, arenas locally on local districts, um, but those still, you know, those still are needs um, locally. And when I say crews, there's lots of crews out there, but when I say crews, a locally controlled crew, probably 10 person-ish size crew, that we can stick on a fire immediately. We don't have to go through the ordering process, which can take a little bit of time but we can get them on there immediately. So those, those were um, key then, and they're still important now. <clears throat> what we've, can, as, as our fire seasons have kind of continued to get longer, and um, we've seen a shortage of middle managers on fires. Um, it takes a long time to get folks trained up. So on top, those of you that know the lingo, division supervisors, task force leaders, we brought in 20 of them from New Zealand and Australia last year. <laughs> to help us in a pinch. And so we have the ability to go out and get folks like that, but it takes a while to get them here. And so those are key. Um, our agency put together uh, an initiative um, kind of answering that question. What, what do we need to get through these next fire seasons? So that is out there. You could Google that and see what that is. Um, and that's, you know, that's out there for the legislature to consider uh, this year. So. Yeah. Well, apparently the answer is always money, right? <laughs> we had more money, we could do lots of cool things. Well, it, indeed that is true when we talk about the landscape approach to creating opportunities to better manage wildfires, to be able to be more successful in suppressing them. Um, we need more money to turn the corner and make the landscape one that is manageable. Um, that's part of this road basin strategy proposal, and it is not cheap. Um, you know, there's, there's an old way of thinking about how to do work in the woods that uh, is kind of predicated on we're getting money out of the deal. We're going to go and we're going to do some logging, and it's going to pay for itself, and maybe we put some money in our pockets. And we need to start thinking about the forest in a different way. It's not necessarily a cash cow. Yes, some commodities, some logs can be a result of that, but they're result of doing the work that needs to be done out there. And we can't expect that that work is always going to turn a profit or even pay for itself because honestly, a lot of the bad fires start in places that aren't tall timber. They're tall grass and brush. And as we know, well, you're not going to make a lot of money cutting tall grass and brush. But nonetheless, that's a lot of the work that needs to happen, especially in our lower elevation areas around communities. So we need a significant investment. Our congressional delegation is doing, I think, a pretty good job of asking for that. And the governors of Oregon, Washington, California uh, recently asked the administration to double the wildfire 
budget, wildfire suppression and prevention budget. Um, I don't know where that's gone. Uh, we have now doubled the capacity of the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, one that could definitely benefit Southern Oregon. That would be a $4 million a year shot in the arm for this kind of work. Um, there's money on the way from the state that we're going to be doing a press release about uh, very soon. Um, but all of that is not enough. Um, and if we want to see the benefits from this kind of work, we need to invest heavily and we need to invest soon and not let that straggle on for years and years and years as we try to figure out what we need to do. We already know what we need to do. There's a plan for it. We just need the money to start putting it together. And um, it's, going, it's going to be a difficult road to get that much money. But uh, the alternative is not a very good one. And so I, I think that uh, we see what we need to do, and we keep delivering that message to our politicians, and they hear it and realize that an investment has to be made. Anything, Jane? Anything on your wish list? Something that uh, keeps you up at night? Mm -hmm. In terms of a wish list, it's actually kind of a silly question because we're such a tiny little department, so we need everything. more equipment. So, uh, yeah, what what keeps me up at night is a repeat of what happened last spring with the climate on fire, and. Uh, uh, or, or any large fire in my district because it is such a heavily forested, uh, very, very dense forest area, lots of residents, only three ways in or out. So, yeah, that's what we can spend. I just wanted to kind of go back on that piece. You know, we, we talk about money and when we're asking for money, you know, everybody starts to kind of cringe. So if I was to look at this room and say, hey, we need $100 million, right? If you really want us to help with this problem, we need $100 million. How many people would think I was crazy? And it's okay to raise your hand. <laughs> or I could say, you know what we need? $500 million to pay for what happened last year. And that's really when you take a look at the state of Oregon, it's $500 million on federal and private plans. And so we had to go, and our, just our office alone, State Fire Marshal's office, had to request $30 million. I can tell you $30 million will buy you a lot of equipment and $30 million will buy you a lot of protection. So those are the things that we really have to start thinking about is how much do we want to continue to spend on suppression. You know, we're going to have to really dig down deep and we're really going to have to make that decision that we do want to solve this problem and it is going to take some funding to do so. so. Yeah. Sure. Is there anything I forget to ask you all that you're just talking about? Before I introduce our mystery guest. Okay, so we'll come back to it. So, uh, speaking of uh, resource gaps and adequacy of uh, resources in the state of Oregon, uh, from the governor's office, we have uh, Alex Campbell. Uh, come on, uh, Alex. I don't know if you're still here. And, uh, Alex is the Regional Solutions Coordinator for the Southern Oregon Region in the Office of Governor Kay Brown. Previously served as the Executive Director of the Partnership for Economic Development in Douglas County. And he led the resource and economic development efforts of the City of Milwaukee in Happiness County. Good Thank you to Representative Marsh for including our, our office. And, uh, uh, and I want to also share my apology. Our, our uh, the leader of our governor's natural resource office, Jason Miner, really wanted to be here tonight and look at flights, um, but uh, could, couldn't make it work. Um, so, um, but I am really pleased to be here. I, I live here, um, so I, I care a lot about the issues that, that we're talking about tonight. Um, first, I, a lot of the things that I, that I want to emphasize tonight have already been mentioned. Um, we, we can access additional supplemental funds in the case of the sort of funding the acute response to fire, but the issues that we've been talking about, the prevention funding, 
Um, are, and it's a scale of increase of funding that's really significant. Um, and so, on one hand, the, the, the answer or our position or what we know is pretty simple. We know we need more money. On the other hand, the legislature is not very responsible to statements. We know we need more money, but we're, trust us, we'll spend it wisely. So, the governor is, um, is, will shortly be announcing, um, already has been alluded to in her budget, um, in an executive order that will come out shortly, um, the governor's commission on the future of wildfire preparedness in Oregon. And that is to make uh, a detailed case with our eye on the next short session to, to talk to the legislature not only about funding, but also our model of fire response. Um, one of the things that, uh, that they, they did talk about is, is you know, we, we have a model of a lot of ODF employees are called to different duties during fire season. With the longer fire season, is that really the right model to go about things? Um, we have questions of, of what is the appropriate balance between prevention and suppression that, that we were just talking about. Um, we feel like we need a real, some really clear answers on, on those questions to present to the legislature, um, particularly um, as we do believe that there are significantly more, more resources needed. Um, one of the other top items that we didn't touch on a lot today is the difference between protected and unprotected areas. There are a number in the, which really was highlighted in Josephine County this past year. Um, and that, that's, that's an issue where you know, several, several property owners were left with bills of, uh, I think, six figures um, because they, there was a state response to a fire that threatened their property, but they were not in an area that, that uh, was protected by a, a, fire, a fire protection district. Um, and so that, that's another issue that, that really needs to be addressed and, and looked at uh, thoroughly and carefully. Um, we, this, the commission will have a, a broad representation. It would have been announced probably already if we didn't have confirmation that we have the right chair. We believe that it's very important that, that this be announced with the chair identified and as the right person. So that, that, that you'll hear about that, that shortly. Um, the topics to be considered are, are not limited to, but you know, clearly the top two are funding for wildfire response um, the, and, and the method of, of, of response. Uh, we, it will also, um, we are expecting that there would be subcommittees looking at forest health and resilience, problems of wildfire smoke, and, and also assistance to, to communities who are suffering the consequences of, of of, of wildfires. I, I've spent a lot of my last couple of years working with folks in Brookings and, and in the Illinois Valley in response to the Chetville Bar fire, in response to the Taylor Creek fire. Governor has been on the ground here with us, with, with Dave, um, with Jim. Um, she's very aware that there's significant impacts on a wide variety of communities, not only because of the threat of smoke, no, uh, sorry, the threat of, the threat of destruction, but also the smoke. Um, I, I was glad to hear Chief Chambers mention that you know the Southern Oregon Forest Restoration Collaborative. Uh, many of those folks are here. Um, the, the additional funding that OWE uh, approved this week um, is is valuable, and I think it was you know a step in bringing that to scale. Um, I think this this the folks who are working on, have been working on that for years are to be commended. You know that the level of planning and prioritization that went in that, that provides the basis for that plan, I think makes funders very comfortable with providing the resources to carry that out. And so I think that's going to continue to continue to serve the, to the region the region well. Um, I also mentioned just a small end, the, the good neighbor authority was mentioned as well. That we, uh, Governor Brown did make that permanent that as allowing state employees to be working on federal lands. Um, clearly, the relationship between the state and the state's approach and, and, and the feds and the feds approach on federal land is something that we will continue and, and, and needs to continue to be discussed. Um, and that, that is not something that's outside of the purview of, of the, uh, the, this commission. Um, thank you.
think that those, those are the chief primary points I want to touch on. And, and I thank you all for, for uh, coming out tonight and, and including our office. Thank you. Do, do you, any of you have questions for clarification? We have time to explore this. I, I probably exhausted my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs>
we're, we're not in this just by ourselves. We're not the only little valley that's under threat. We are not. Before I call Pam up here to conclude, I want to ask you all a question. I think, just so we don't leave this on a real grim note about that, I, I think we, we agree that these, uh, it says here, uh, unrelenting and persistent conditions. So you just alluded to our adaptive, our adaptive communities. We talked a lot tonight about uh, about changing the landscape to be more resilient in fire. Uh, we probably could talk quite a bit more about what a fire adaptive community is, but one of those things is uh, the community communication with uh, between protection agencies, between the agencies capable of affecting the landscape. What can we tell them individually, tell these folks? How do you remain, remain resilient? Let's just say we had another fire season like we had the last two years. What do we do differently? How do we stick together as a community? How do we protect ourselves? Anybody got any inspirational messages here? Please. Well, one of the things that um, I saw, and it was fairly late in the season, where uh, folks in uh, Ashland started talking about we really need to get downtown and support our local businesses. You know, I, I think I think there are there's um, during the recession there was a lot of talk about staycations, right? Um, and I think uh, a lot of small businesses um, really struggle. A lot of medium-sized businesses um, have been impacted uh, hard. Um, I, I guess one one thing we might want to think about is, you know, September was surprisingly clear um, this past year, and uh, so on the on the economic impact side, you know, the state has funded a study to, to help some of our our, uh, our tourist dependent businesses think about how they they adapt and what kind of seasonality and what kind of approaches um, they they might take. Um, but uh, I think I think as a community, there there are things that, that we can do, you know, and especially if we, we start thinking about it up front and about uh, continue to, to support the, the businesses that are impacted. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, to cheer what Alex said is uh, Ashland has got together obviously a tourist dependent economy significant impacts to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival are already happened and happening and the trickle down to that in the Ashland economy is pretty serious um, I've got very good friends that are right now thinking about selling their house and moving and I'm sure you have either had similar thoughts or know people who are having similar thoughts and so you know, thinking about that uh, at the community scale, we came up with a program called SmokeWise Ashland. And what we tried to spread in SmokeWise, and it's a partnership with the Ashland Chamber of Commerce, also with our, our local hospital through the Asante system, and then we've got local organizations like the YMCA and the university at the table as well. And, uh, you know, part of it is saying, okay, there's going to be smoke. What can we do to make the best of it? What are the public health recommendations that we can best embrace and follow through on? What kind of filtration is needed in our school system? Uh, actually, because of testimony that I gave at a school bond committee meeting, the Ashland School District passed a bond to revamp all of the air conditioning systems to be um, smoke compliant. I don't know what exactly the word is, um, but in their new bond, they're going to go and uh, totally uh, overhaul all the air handling systems so that students can be safe when they're in school and there's smoke in the air. Um, so those kinds of things are, are happening. We're gonna host a, a regional leaders conference about SmokeWise and, and thinking about smoke uh, at the end of February uh, to get more people on board with this. And it goes from you know the everything from the smallest business to large organizations and uh, as an example, the university uh, during the smoke this year, they replaced all their filters with the, uh, the high, high filters, and then they invited the community to come in 
and spend time indoors in their new recreation facility, in the library, so that there were public spaces that people knew were clean and they could go hang out in. And you know, part of the challenge is social isolation when we get into those smoky times and we, we all just want to sit in our house and we don't want to go outside because then we'd have to go into the smoke and it's uncertain as to where you're going would be a place that's healthy to hang out. And so having public spaces where people can connect is really important. And I think that's something that um, we're moving quickly towards, having already done some of it, uh, but we can embrace a lot more of that community type spirit uh, as we move forward. And I think that we all can benefit from doing more of that uh, in this, those smoky summers that uh, we will have in the future, hopefully not every year, but Thank you. Anyone else? Anything you, you wish I'd asked you or comment on? Ben, could you uh, come up and wrap it up for us? And maybe recap a little bit about what you heard here today and where all this information goes next. It has been my theory that one of the ways that we can cope with these persistent and difficult conditions that we've been facing, what I've characterized as really an existential crisis as we move around our community and try and figure out what the future offers us, is to empower ourselves with the understanding of the situation that's facing us. Uh, that was the reason that we brought the community together in the Smoke and Fire Summit in September, is to really pool our joint wisdom about how we can stay economically resilient, how we can address the health impacts uh, facing our communities, how we can gather resources together to do the critical forest management work um, that is so important to prevention. We heard a lot about that tonight. And tonight's wildfire forum was the second in that effort. And I think, um, I hope that you will join me in feeling that we, that we are very fortunate in that we have agencies and personnel who are assigned um, to be diligent, to watch over our community, starting with the very, very tiny rural fire districts, which are the first folks out on the ground, and including the Oregon Department of Forestry, um, which has as its, as its focus um, safety, um, but is always moving immediately on the fires that approach our communities. The State Fire Marshal's Office, which has the abilities, as described, to really garner support from forest, uh, from fire departments uh, across the state and to deploy them when needed to hot spots across the state. Um, and of course, we have the U.S. Forest Service, not represented here tonight, but an agency that we know brings a lot of support to our communities. So there are a lot of people out there looking out for us, and I think that should be a comfort to all of us as we look toward the next fire season. And I also heard a lot of marching orders going forward after tonight. We heard a lot of actions that we need to take to make sure that we remain as safe a community as possible. And I've got my notes right here, and I'm sure the other legislators in the room do too. We heard about detection and the importance of technology that will allow us to detect these fires quick, more quickly than ever and to get at them more quickly than ever. We heard about the importance of funding local initiatives so that we can both work in the forest and so that those local firefighters can get there, out there on the ground as quickly as possible. We heard about the value of aircraft, the need to really identify and fund crews, we heard about the importance of middle managers. And overall, we heard about the importance of cash. Because all of these operations, um, both the, on the prevention side and the suppression side, need uh, our ability to invest in them. So we have a lot of marching orders going forward. We have a governor's task force, which is going to take on the critical issues around workforce and funding as we see fire seasons um, that are very different in the future than the ones we've seen in the past. So a lot of great information shared tonight. I hope it was valuable to you. And I want to um, acknowledge the wonderful panelists who spent their evening with us and thank them for coming down. Uh, they may have a few minutes if you want to grab them for a specific question. And thank you to all of you for coming tonight and sharing this really critical community discussion. <laughs>